Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to St. George's Church for lecture one of two of the Richard McKinney Memorial Advent Lecture Series. I'm just going to speak to our director and ask if we're on air. Yes, we are. So to our online audience who are watching us via YouTube, a very warm welcome to St. George's Church this evening. As we, for the very first time in the history of this lecture series, we broadcast live to the world. Uh, this church is 60, or this parish is 61 years old today. Uh, the church was 57 years old a few weeks ago. And I'm reliably informed that when uh, those who went before us had a vision for this church, part of the vision was that one day the ABC and such like would broadcast live uh, from the church. That's only happened on one or two occasions before the advent of COVID. And since COVID-19 came along, we've been broadcasting live to the world every week since Sunday, the 29th of March. And so uh, with one, two exceptions. And so now the Richard McKinney Memorial Lectures go live courtesy of YouTube uh, to the world. And so COVID-19 has brought huge restrictions and disruption to individual and communal life, but it's also provided huge opportunities. And uh, one opportunity has been for the Christian churches and uh, other religious traditions around the world through the medium of the internet and digital technology to provide a window into our world. We would hope through our digital presence and through this lecture this evening and next week that not only is it a window into Advent and Christmas for East meeting West, but maybe hopefully it acts as the door which allows people to step into our world and for us to step into theirs. So this evening is my great pleasure to welcome Father Shenouda Boutros, President of the Victorian Council of Churches, and the Reverend Ian Smith as the Executive Officer of the Victorian Council of Churches, and to welcome you here to the Richard McKinney Memorial Lecture and welcome to our online audience. Our online audience, sadly, will not be able to participate in questions this evening, but this audience can more than make up for them. Thank you. Father Shenouda and I were just chatting about that. If we stand here, do we block the screen for anybody? Can you see through me? <laughs> Father, do you want to come and can you help me move this? We'll put it <laughs> Sorry. What's how we just put it? So we want to begin by saying it's a real privilege to be among you and uh, I want to begin too by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people, the uh, custodians of the land on which we live and I want to pay my respects to elders past and present and to those who are emerging and I think we ought to as Christians commit ourselves to the continuing process of reconciliation particularly among our First Peoples, but with all peoples in this country. And uh, at a recent conference, we were saying that in Victoria, we now have 234 nationalities. We speak 145 languages. That's living languages. And we have somewhere in the vicinity of 105 different recognised faith communities across Victoria, of which we are a significant proportion of those communities. But Father Chanuda and I are really keen to be here, and it's really great to be among you. Uh, I had the privilege of actually meeting Richard uh, McKinney in his latter life, and uh, I enjoyed a meal with him at uh, Union House in the middle of Melbourne University. 
Um, I forget the name of that building, but it was a lovely old building in the middle of Melbourne University. So we began this journey at Easter, and we began a conversation about the church and how it practices, and the very unique role of the council in the sense that the council in Victoria holds together a whole lot of really diverse expressions of church. And for the last 18 months, we've been really privileged, I've been really privileged as the executive officer, to work with a person who has become an extremely good friend, Father Shenouda. And together we have chatted about the differences between us and me as a Westerner and, uh, you know, post-Reformation and all the bits and pieces that we live out of. And Father Shenouda, who in one sense, his part of the church traces its ancestry back to about 64 AD. So that's, you know, that's in the lifetime of the apostles. And so this was a really unique opportunity to have a conversation about how our different traditions have grown and learnt to express the very same truths, but in very different ways, often. We began with Lent, and we experienced together the conversations around how Easter has been developed in our two different communities. Tonight, we begin a two-week series on Advent, and I suspect that like at Easter, we'll find lots of comparisons where we sit really comfortably with what we both think. But there'll be gaps and there'll be differences. And I think these two nights will be celebrations of the diversity and the wonder and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to do a little bit of a tag team. We're going to start tonight with a little bit of a snapshot of pre-1055, pre the Great Schism, pre the breaking of the East-West, the difference between was the Bishop of Rome more important than the Bishop of Constantinople with a few other theological bits tied in. And then we're going to have, a, then I'm going to explore for a few moments a little bit about what we would understand coming from our Western traditions about the journey of Advent. And then I'm going to hand over to Father Shenouda and he's going to take us through their experience because theirs is really different. Right? But I won't spoil his thunder. But just to say, the way we recognise and participate in Advent is very significantly different. So, let's begin. Like we discovered when we looked at Easter, it took the, the church almost 400 years to work out what to do with Christmas and Advent. The earliest recording we can find anywhere in any of the scriptures or any of the writings of the early church fathers and even the writings of some of the church historians like Eusebius is this bishop... Perpetuous of Tours, who in the early 5th century decided that from the time of the Feast of St. Martin, which is about the 11th of November, through to Christmas, all of the people in his diocese of Tours had to fast. But you didn't have to fast for seven days, you only had to fast for any three of the seven. And he wasn't particularly fussed which of the three. Uh, yeah. So that's the earliest recording we have of something unique happening around this time of the year. Remembering that this time of the year in the early church is definitely not 36 with the humidity of 60. Right? It might be 36 Fahrenheit not 36 centigrade. And it might have a humidity of five or six, and there could be three feet of snow outside. So we're operating in a world that is vastly different to our world here in the south, where right, a day like today where it's 26 and 80% humidity and it's really hot and humid, 
Um, it's a different world. Three centuries after the good bishop, there becomes a whole lot of conversations in the church about Advent. Constantinople says, maybe it should be 18 days at beginning on the 6th of December. So maybe Advent should run from the 6th of December to the 25th, about 18 days. Another bishop from down near Libya says, no, you only need to do it for the three days from the 22nd to the 25th. So there's a bit of fluidity in the early church about what this period of time really means. But the bit of consistency we have in tonight's story is that up until the Reformation, everything about Advent was sombre. It was about penance. It was about fasting. It was about being prepared ritualistically, if you like, for the coming of the Christ child. Now, post the great schism of 1055, where the East and the Western churches adopt different ecclesial models, right? we in the West, we see these two things happen. By just after the Great Schism, and it could have been something to do with the Crusades and the fact that half of Europe walked across into Asia and slaughtered everybody. You know, there's a very famous story that in 1066 or 1070, when the first Crusade got to Constantinople, when it went into the church, which was an Eastern Orthodox church, and when they did Eucharist, the, the English and the French Crusaders didn't recognise the service as legitimate and so they slaughtered the Christians in the church because they weren't Western Christians. It looked different. It smelt different. So we live with a bit of tension when we have these conversations that not everything we did in the West is good stuff. But this idea of Advent had become really non-important non in the church. So by the 12th century in the Western churches, some of the popes are lamenting the fact that people no longer take it seriously. Nobody fasts, nobody bothers to do the liturgy, and you can read stories of popes lamenting the decline of Advent as a significant part of the church calendar. 1515, and a young Lutheran, who was then, who was a young Catholic priest, sitting in his little tower in Salisbury, having a conversation with God, and he, he reads Romans 3, 21 to 26, and about expiation and the fact that we are called by grace and not by works. And he goes and apocryphally nails a piece of paper to the front of the church door in Wittenberg, and we're born. Well, if we're Anglicans and Uniting and Baptists and Church of Christ and Anabaptists and all those, we're born. And then from then till now, we've had these two streams of the Western Church, one represented by Bill's world and Bill's story and Bill's narrative of Mother of God or, and the story that's been told out of this place which is probably closer to Bill's story in one sense, but the Western narrative, the Anglican narrative, the Baptist narrative. So you get these two forms of how this period plays out. Now, a little bit about timing. So we've talked a little bit about the timing. The history varies, right? The earliest sometimes in November, right? Currently, we begin on the first Sunday closest to St Andrew's Day, which is the 30th of November. And so if you're in this community and Bill's community, last Sunday morning and in my community, we began Advent, right? We had the wreath, we lit the first candle and we heard the story of getting ready.
For us, it includes the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. But in some of our Western traditions, it actually includes five Sundays. Because for some of our churches, they actually celebrate the Sunday between Christmas and Epiphany as a Sunday of expectation. It's also for us the beginning of our liturgical year. And so for the Western Church, the liturgical year always begins with the first Sunday in Advent. Now, the timing of Christmas is really interesting. December the 25th, if you take the biblical story in Matthew and Luke, there is no way the the shepherds were out in the field on the 25th of December on the hills of Tekoa. If you're on the hills of Tekoa on the 25th of December, you're knee deep in snow. And you don't have your sheep out there or your goats. And the Bedouins of those hills put all their animals away in November and they keep them in the tents with them until the end of March. But around the 4th century, the Christmas day becomes fixed and it becomes fixed around what for the Northern Hemisphere is the winter solstice. And you can see the symmetry and the theology in the winter solstice. The ch- it's the shortest day for them, right? For us, it's the 21st of June. And once you get past it, everything is birth, new life. You can see the synergy and why it works. Then we come to Epiphany. And uh, for most of us in the West, we celebrate Epiphany on the 6th of January. It picks up the story of the Magi, right? And it takes the story of Jesus and the birth from a local, colloquial Jewish narrative and places it in a global, cosmic setting. Because where do the Magi come from? The East. And in the first century, what was the East in comparison to Palestine? You think of Iran and Iraq and the different places, Mesopotamia and those communities, right? They're the source of great learning, great wisdom, deep spirituality. So for us in the West, Epiphany marks the moment when the story of Jesus goes from being a colloquial Jewish story to being a global narrative. And we'll talk the theology of Advent next week, but that's just up here. Now, hopefully this bit bit works. Now, Shanuta and I decided that we do a bit of the narrative, a bit of the timing, and then we talk about some practice tonight. We'll do the theology. So here's a bit of practice that we do. So one of the things most of us in the West do is do the candles. Right? Now, depending on what tradition, the candles have different meanings. They can be love, peace, hope, right? joy. Right? They can be preparation. Right? And if you read the text, the first text in Isaiah is about the one coming. The second one's about John the Baptist preaching the word. The third one is about the joy of the gift of salvation. The fourth one is about the Annunciation of Mary. Lots of different ways, but the candles can have different meanings. The second thing in the West is that we sing. O come all ye faithful, hark the herald angels sing. Joy to the world. All those carols are part of the Advent tradition, aren't they? And if you think that most of the carols were written when 80% of the community were illiterate, what are the carols doing? The carols are education. You think, O little town of Bethlehem, how sweet we see you lie. 
You, you read through the seven verses of that, and by the time you get to the end of it, what have you sung? You've sung the gospel story. And for people who can't read and can't read the text because the text isn't necessarily in the vernacular that they can read, carols became an incredible teaching tool of the church. The same as the Stations of the Cross. The same as stained glass windows. Right? Now this is almost sacrilegious, but the Chrissy tree. Right? The first Christmas tree was in 1527. Right? Martin Luther, after he'd separated from the Catholic Church and had married his, his wife, was walking through the town and the only thing green in the middle of the town at Christmas was a fir tree. And he was struggling for a theme for his Christmas morning service and he thought, ah, I've got an idea. And he cut a limb off that tree in 1527 and the next morning, Christmas born, he stuck, the, he stuck the limb up in church and he said, this is a symbol of Christmas because in the middle of the deep winter, what's the tree saying? Life has come. Right? But for most of us, right, white Westerners from Europe, Christmas trees don't really happen until the 18th century. And it happens when the Lutheran church begins to use Christmas trees to extend the Luther image. And then for those that are English, like my ancestry, right? Christmas trees didn't arrive in England until 1886. Right? When our first Queen Elizabeth married her sweetheart, Prince Albert, and the first Christmas, Albert insisted on bringing a fir tree across from Germany because that's what he'd grown up with all his life. And he planted a fir tree in Buckingham Palace and everybody ran, what? What the? And within 20 years, it became part of our Western world. Presents are fascinating in the Western world and how we've corrupted it. The first presents were actually given away. If you go back to Holland and you go back to uh, a guy called Nicholas, uh, Bishop Nicholas, the story goes that Nicholas asked all these people in his town, they were to set aside money over Advent and when they had, on the 22nd, they were to buy a present and find the poorest and the most vulnerable person they could find and give the present. Isn't it interesting over the centuries in the West how we've taken the giving away of a gift as a sign of the gift of God to the fact that, you know, we hanker for how many are around the Christmas tree. Um, there was, I got given a beautiful tea towel last year by a Dutchman, by my Dutch brother-in-law. And it's, simply, it's a Christmas tree. And there are no presents. And it simply says... It is not what's under the tree that's important, but it's who gathers at the tree. Trying to recapture that sense. But presents you know, are almost an abhorrence in a sense to the biblical narrative. Although I understand you can spin it that, you know, we get a gift and it reminds us of the gift of God. But in a sense, how many of us have one of these? Up, up already at home. Right? How many of us have nativity seeds? Right? It's become a way, hasn't it? My wife, on the uh, 1st of De December, when I, I always walk into home, and there it is in, on, the, on the writing bureau in our front porch. As soon as you walk in the front door for the, for the month of December, the nativity stream is there. And for Karen... It shapes her advent. It reminds her of the centrality of the Christ story as against the busyness, the right chook, who's going to host, all those other things that we have. Practices that we in the West are very familiar with. 
I'm now going to hand over to Father Shenouda, who is going to open for us the world of the Eastern communities. Thanks, Anne. How do I go back on this? Yeah, that's the first one. Oops, so how do I go back in? Sorry. Oh, you've gone forward. I've gone forward. Um, just to, uh, to, before I begin, thank you uh, again for um, inviting us. Uh, thank you, Father John, for inviting us. I thought after last time, um, I would have bored everybody, and, but uh, we thank you again for re-inviting us and I'm very honoured and uh, very pleased to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, what we call the Feast of Nativity uh, from the uh, Coptic Orthodox perspective. So I'm a priest in the Coptic Orthodox Church, um, which is part of the uh, Oriental Orthodox Church of families. So within the Orthodox uh, churches, we have two two communities, if you like. You have what we call the Eastern Orthodox Church, which include the Greeks and the Russians and all those Slavic countries. Um, and then you have the Oriental churches, which uh, the Oriental Orthodox churches, which are um, the Middle East, um, across to India, Armenia, Syria, uh, Egypt, Ethiopia. Um, they're the they're the main Main family, uh, main main churches within the uh, Oriental Orthodox Church. Uh, Oriental means Eastern as well, but it was just a way of distinguishing between the two families. I think so. We've got Eastern and Oriental, and they more properly are probably split along the uh, Council of Chalcedon. So, if you know your church history, the Eastern Orthodox Church um, were pro Council of Chalcedon, and the Orientals were perhaps against some of the things that were decided upon in the Council of Chalcedon, but that could be a lecture for, a, for another time. So we'll focus a little bit on uh, the Feast of Nativity. So I'm going to uh, speak a little bit about um, our calendar and our fast, because in the, uh, as Ian touched on, in the Orthodox Church, um, the lead up to the Feast of Nativity, what we call Advent, is actually a fasting period, a heavily, uh, quite a, quite a uh, intensive fasting period. And then I'll speak a little bit about our lectionary, how we actually, what we actually, um, I guess what we practice through the period of Advent and also our vigils that we have during, so some of our practices. So our fast begins, um, and I guess a, a maybe quick uh, discussion on the calendar. So we actually celebrate uh, Christmas on the 7th of January. But this is actually due to uh, the fact that we follow the Julian calendar in, in our church. So it's purely a calendar issue, not celebrating on a different day. It's only a coincidence that at the moment, the 7th of January falls on um, or close to the 6th of January, which is the Feast of the Epiphany in the West. Um, so as you may or may not know, the difference between the Julian calendar and the Gregorian calendar, which the West is following, is about 13 days. So there's 13 days that separate us. So if you calculate the 7th of January, it actually falls on the 25th of December. Um, we follow um, the ancient Egyptian calendar in terms of the months and the, the names that are used. So for us, we celebrate, um, or we begin the Advent um, on the 16th of Hatur. Hatur is the Coptic month that we begin the fast which corresponds to the 25th of November. So um, our fasting period is actually 40 days. So if we calculate um, the feast of, uh, or the fast of Advent, it begins on the 16th of Hatur and finishes on what we call the 29th of Kiach. Kiach is the Coptic month in which we celebrate um, Christmas, which falls on um, the 7th of January. If you calculate it, you'll actually find it's 43 days. And I'll talk a little bit why, about why it's 43 days. But um, traditionally, it's always been, um, well, we begin with 40 days. 
The 40 days is actually taken from the fast that Moses um, did for 40 days before he went up on the mount and received uh, the, the word of God. And so the church, um, and there is no clarity as to when this fasting period began. Um, Ian touched on it uh, in the early church in the first three centuries. The Feast of Christmas and the Feast of Epiphany were actually celebrated together um, on the 25th of December. I'll speak in Gregorian calendar terms just so we don't get confused. So um, it actually was all celebrated together. It wasn't until St. Athanasius, St. Athanasius, the one who of the, uh, first ecumenic, uh, you know, of the First Ecumenical Council, who was known for or attributed the, uh, the, the creed, the Nicene Creed, um, he's actually the first one that in, um, spoke about separating the two feasts. Um, we don't know whether it actually happened then and there, but he did, um, in Egypt anyway, in Alexandria, started to separate the feasts out so that um, Christmas was celebrated. And then 13 days later, we find, uh, sorry, 12 days later, we find the Feast of Epiphany. Whether that's where we get the 12 days of Christmas from, I'm not sure. But, um, and so we actually end up celebrating uh, the Epiphany now on, usually falls around the 18th or the 19th of January, about 12 days after the 7th. Um, but originally, of course, it was celebrated together. It wasn't until about um, the 11th century that we get a clear, in, in Egypt anyway, we get a clear distinction between the two. In the Armenian church, they actually still celebrate Christmas and Epiphany together. So you'll find that they celebrate um, uh, Christmas and Epiphany on the 6th of January in the church. However, of course, the Armenians in the West, as many of us, we still sort of celebrate on the 25th because everyone around us is celebrating on the 25th. But in terms of church liturgy or church rites, they celebrate um, Christmas and Epiphany together on the 6th of January. So we get the 40 days fast from this idea of Moses fasting 40 days before receiving the word of God. And so likewise, we are also preparing ourselves to receive the incarnate Logos, the word of God. And so we get this 40 days of um, fast. However, in the Coptic church in particular, so the other Orthodox churches don't have this, but in the Coptic church, we actually fast for 43 days. And these, the consensus of why we have these extra three days, and there's some debate as to whether this is the real reason or not, but it's an incident that happened um, It's an incident that happened in the, um, around 900, well, around the, the 10th century. So at the time, there were the Pope, or the Patriarch of Alexandria at that time, his name was uh, Pope Abraham. And um, the, um, the ruler of Egypt at that time, his name was El Moiz. He was the caliph, or the, the first caliph of, of the Fatimid dynasty. So he was a... Um, you know, the, uh, by that time, Egypt had been invaded by the Muslims. So this was around the 10th century. And so he was the caliph. And so um, Pope Abraham was actually, he was only pope for three years. But um, in, within his time, he did a lot of rebuilding of churches. And the reason was is that he actually had a great relationship and was well respected by the, by the caliph at the time. At that time, the, the, the prime minister of the country, he, uh, the prime minister of the, the caliph, was actually a Jewish man. And um, he did not like the, uh, the Copts. He didn't like the Christians. And so he went, to the, he went to, the, to the caliph and he told him, in their scriptures, as in, in the Christian scriptures, it says that if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. And so I'm going to prove to you that these Christians are wrong and that their scriptures are wrong because there's no way they can move a mountain. It says that they can, but I, can, I bet you they can't do it. And if they can't do it, you need to get rid of the lot of them. The caliph wasn't happy because he actually liked, like as I said, he had a, this great relationship with Pope Abraham, but he called him and he said, 
It says in your scriptures, so and so. Um, you know, you need to, you know, is, are you, is your faith true or not true? If your faith is not true, I'm going to get rid of all of the Christians out of Egypt. And it wasn't mean that they were going to kick him out. It was actually, we're going to get rid of them. So Pope Abraham was obviously very stressed and distressed at the time. So he called the bishops um, at the time. And so they decided to uh, convene a fast, a three-day fast, because um, they didn't know what to do. So they convened a three-day fast, and they were fasting, and it says that Pope Abraham didn't leave the church, and that he prayed consistently for three days. And then on the third day, he, he collapsed out of exhaustion, and it said that he, had, um, that he had a vision in which the mother of God appeared to him, St. Mary appeared to him, and she told him, wake up, go out of the church, the first man that you come across when you walk out of the church, he is the one who's going to tell you what to do. So he walked out of the church and he came across this poor looking man who had one eye and he was a, a tanner. His name was Simon the Tanner. And he came to him and he told him, this is the situation. St. Mary, uh, Saint Mary the, the mother of God, appeared to me and she said that you're the one who's going to tell us and to show us what to do. And of course, Simon the Tanner, he was actually, there's a story as to why he had one eye. And so he said, it can't be me. I'm just a humble leather worker. It can't be me. And so Pope Abraham asked him to tell him his story. What, what's your, what's your what, who are you? And so he told him, and why do you have one eye? And so he told him his story. And his story is, is that while he, when he was a young man, he was... Um, he was uh, tempted by a woman that he saw. And so he followed the, the scripture to the letter that says, if your eye offends thee, pluck it out. It's better to enter into the kingdom of heaven with, uh, with one eye than in, into hell with both. And since that time, he dedicated himself to serving the poor. So all of his money that he receives that for his wages, he distributes to those who are in need. And he himself lives a very austere life and so Pope Abraham took Simon the Tanner with all the bishops and and so Simon the Tanner told them um, what to do in that they all gather around in front of the mountain and there is a mountain in, 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 in Egypt in Cairo just outside the outskirts of Cairo if anyone's ever been there it's actually called the, the Ma'atum mountain which means the cut mountain and it's known, it's this, this story is recorded in Egyptian history. And so he told them, you're going, to, you're going to pray, Lord, have mercy, 41 times. And every time you, you bow down on Lord, have mercy, you are to stand up again. And you, you're to do this 41 times. So on the time that, you know, they, that the caliph had assigned, he said, all right, prove to me your faith. So the caliph and his men were at one side, the pope and the bishops and all the laity and congregation and deacons were all on, on the other side. And so they started chanting, Lord have mercy. Every time they bowed down on Lord have mercy and stood up, the mountain lifted. And so it lifted so high that they could actually see the sun through the other side. Um, and so this great miracle, of course, um, the church dedicated the three-day fast that Pope Abraham had called and added it to the 40 days fasting that we have in the Advent fast. So that's why we, why we fast um, 43, 43 days. It's a, it's a beautiful story. Um, it is recorded in Egyptian history. So it's, um, and this mountain actually is there. And if you look at, if you see this mountain, as I said, it's known as the Cut Mountain. It's actually now um, home to uh, a great number of Copts. Um, it actually became, um, they're known as the, uh, the Zebelin. The Zebelin means the uh, rubbish collectors. And so um, these, these people were actually very poor people who left um, the countryside and came to Cairo looking for work but couldn't find any work. So they actually um, 
became rubbish, uh, rubbish collectors. And this mountain now has probably one of the biggest concentration of cops and has one of the biggest uh, churches in all of Egypt. Um, and many, you know, many um, uh, hospitals and, and things that have opened up in the area. So we celebrate um, this lead up to, to Advent. Um, in, the, in the lead up, we have what we call four, the four major Sundays before, before uh, the Nativity. And we follow the, the lectionary of the Gospel of uh, St. Luke. So the first Sunday, we actually read the, um, the, the Annunciation of St. John the Baptist's um, uh, birth. So um, this is Luke uh, 1 from 1 to 25. And then the second Sunday we follow uh, Luke 1, 26 to 38, which is the Annunciation of Christ. So Archangel Gabriel announcing uh, to Mary uh, the, the, uh, the Incarnation of Christ. The third Sunday is the meeting of St. Mary um, with St. Elizabeth. Um, and we read that beautiful story where... Um, John the Baptist sleeps in the womb of Elizabeth and Elizabeth sees, says these beautiful words um, of uh, beatification uh, to St. Mary. And then the fourth Sunday is the birth of St. John the Baptist. So that's the lectionary. And then, of course, on the feast itself, we read from the Gospel of St. Matthew, uh, the birth of Christ, chapter 1. So the lectionary pretty much follows, <clears throat> or the Advent follows the actual story of the incarnation of Christ, of the birth of Christ. One of the, um, I suppose, important practices that we have during this lead up uh, to Christmas um, is uh, what we call um, the, it's, this, this month is sometimes, it's sometimes called the Marian month, um, the Marian month being named after St. Mary. And the reason being is that we have these vigils um, which go on for about five hours through the through. So traditionally, it starts at you know on a Saturday evening, and goes all the way through to the liturgy on Sunday morning. And all of the, and I don't know if this is where Christmas carols come from, but all of the hymns um, that are chanted, um, a lot of the hymns, sorry, are focused on Saint Mary. And so people hear this and they go, well, "What's Saint Mary got to do with Christmas?" And the, um, but it's actually not about St. Mary as much as it is about the incarnation, that Christ right, is, is the man God, that he, is, that he is a human being as well as, um, as God. So, um, so the focus is really actually on the incarnation. And so the, the hymns sung throughout, um, through, throughout this month, uh, through these vigils, um, really bring to life... Um, the importance of the incarnation and really the understanding of the salvation that comes to, to all of humanity through the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what, um, that's what we find um, is our practice. The, um, the fasting period is, um, that we fast is um, similar to Lent. So we fast vegan, no, food, uh, no meat, no dairy, um, the only difference in that is the church gives us one concession is that you can have seafood. So it's a little bit easier than the Lent. Lent is no seafood either, so it's just vegetables, just vegan. But during this period, um, we can have um, seafood. I think that's it. And that's, that's pretty much the practices. So all of these Western practices in terms of Christmas trees and... and um, presence and all of that sort of thing. It's not really a, um, something that's found in the, in the East. It has been adopted pretty much by the world globally, but I think these things probably come more, more from the West. I mean, we, you know, our families have Christmas trees and we have presents. And I remember growing up, we used to celebrate Christmas twice, once on the 25th and once, once on the 7th. But this is because, obviously, of the, um, how we find ourselves sort of Celebrating using two different calendars. Um, the greater, you know, the bigger, the bigger celebration is actually the feast we have on Christmas night. So we celebrate 
um, uh, Christmas with a midnight uh, liturgy. So we start at, um, so on Christmas Eve, we start at about 8 o'clock in the evening and go all the way through to about 1 o'clock in the morning. And then everybody goes home to their family and has a big feast and then wake up the next morning with a very sore stomach because they've been fasting, right? And then all of a sudden they've broken their fast with all these, you know, heavy meats and things like that. So, <laughs> but that's how, we, uh, that's how we celebrate Christmas. I don't know if we have any questions for Ian or for myself, but... Uh, Thank you, uh, Father Shenouda and Ian. And whilst uh, people think whether they've got any questions, um, I thank you both for laying down some markers uh, in preparation for hearing the theology of Advent uh, in your address next week. But in this year of all years, when millions of people around the world are confronted with the reality of pandemic, ill health, death, and loss of employment and livelihood, and much of the, many of the countries in the Northern Hemisphere uh, will spend Advent seeking to prevent further deaths or experiencing death in family groups. I wondered if you had this evening any reflections on the meaning of Advent for the broader world in the context in which we find ourselves. It's a season of expectation, and hope, hope, peace, love, joy, the four great themes uh, for much of the Western tradition. So I wondered if you had a thought or a reflection on the meaning of Advent for the world in our current context. Thank you. Do you want me to go first? Okay. I think um, the message of hope that comes from the incarnation is actually very... Is, it's a vital message in today's world. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, we've suffered this year great anxiety and uncertainty, um, and even you know that isolation and the loneliness that you know that comes with that. And I think the incarnation is a reminder that God is with us. You know, we say that, that you know that His name is Emmanuel. That means God is with us, and we're not alone. And that all of the, um, all of this anxiety and all of this uh, uncertainty that we've been feeling, and the hopelessness that comes out of that, and the and the loneliness. Um, I think what, if there's one message that we can remember is that God is with us. God is with us even through what seems, you know, very difficult times. Um, and that is the message, I think, um, and, and that is what Christ's incarnation was, is that he became man, he became one of us in order that we actually unite with him, that we can see and know who we are in him, and that, um, you know, we call him the second Adam. You know, we give him this title um, in the Orthodox Church, we call him the second Adam, because he is what we're supposed to be. And when we unite ourselves with him, and when we become one with him, then we actually know what it means to be a human being, and what it means, how and how it is to actually um, treat each other and to love one another. So the incarnation is, is no doubt, is a is a message of hope, um, and a message of um, fraternity, or a message of of family. That we are actually all one. That we are one people, and that. God himself becomes one of us in order to unite all of us in him. So um, I think this is something we should keep in mind when we think of uh, Christmas. My one comment to your question would be to reflect on the John 1, 14, which says, um, God became man and dwelt among us. And that passage in John, 14, John 1, 14 talks about the fact that the world is worthy, creation's worthy, people are worthy, and that there is a oneness and there's a togetherness in humanity. Um, I think one of the 
the stories of this point in time is that the Advent story, the Advent journey to Christmas, to the Christ event, is a story of hope in the midst. Eleanor Roosevelt is said, is reported to have said, in response to a very nasty comment from a person as to why she was so caring, she said, it is better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. And there's a really powerful story in the Advent that as we walk through this story, whether it's in the Eastern journey or our journey, it's a story of not being alone. It's a story of togetherness. It's a story of the whole world is caught up in this cosmic event. And that the event is an event that has a promise, hope. The hope is that we're not alone. The hope is that we discover the reality of the Christ child in our midst, in the friendship of one another, in the warmth of the smile, in the hand held out to care, in the ability to walk beside the other. I think it's a really powerful story of hope in the midst of tragedy. But I affirm what, what Chanute is saying, that it's all about the incarnation. It's all about the fact that this world is so valuable, so important, that God comes and spends time in the midst. Other questions? Have we opened up things for you? Have we teased you? Has Shanuta taken you in a journey that's awakened new things in you and you just want to make a comment? Because it's okay to make a comment. You don't have to ask a question. Yep? Sorry.
Thank you. Sandra, we probably only have time for one final comment or question. If you'd like to move to the microphone, because we have an online audience. Well, well, we've been locked up, not quite like goats or sheep, for six, seven months <laughs> here in Melbourne, but we've now emerged into our spring and summertime. Uh, thank you for gathering here this evening. Thank you, Father Shenouda and Ian, for laying down some markers at this Advent for us. We look forward to journeying with you next week here in this place and online via YouTube as we explore the theology of Advent. To our online audience, thank you for joining us and hopefully you'll spread the news through your friends and family that will be online again at the same time next week from the same place. But for this evening, I'll close with a prayer for us all. Eternal God, as we await the coming of our Saviour, give us the courage to hope. Give grace to see your plans of redemption for our lives, for this community, and for the world. Through Jesus Christ, the source of our redemption and hope. Amen. Thank you and good night to you all.